Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Crew's Breakfast Seminar um, being held here in London during LME Week. Um, the theme of today's presentations is uh, market uncertainty, and more specifically, it's about understanding commodity market uncertainty, both the opportunities and the threats. But before that, there is some housekeeping I need to take you through. So um, this event is being recorded today, and um, that will be sent out to all of you via email, so you will be able to download the, uh, a recording of the event. And for those of you that want the PowerPoint presentation itself, we'll be sending out a survey later on this week. If you complete the survey and give us feedback, you can download the presentation. <laughs> so please complete the survey. Um, what I would say is if you want to use anything from the presentations today in any way, shape, or form, you know, when you download the presentation, please take time just to look through the disclosure. Okay. So um, before we get on to the presentation, I just want to share a few things that we've been doing at Crew over the last 12 months. Um, as you know, Crew has four main business services, that is events and conferences. We have a consulting business, market analysis, and price assessment. And we've been investing in all four of those areas, both here in the UK and overseas over the last 12 months. Um, in particular, we've put a lot of focus into the APAC region, China, and the rest of the region. And we've now got over 40 professionals working in the APAC region. Um, and by my last count, you know, about, well, about exactly four of them were British expats, which I think is a good thing because we don't need English people abroad trying to understand the local markets. The rest of them, some 20, 24 are Chinese nationals, and the rest are a mixture of Indian nationals, Australian nationals. And that's allowed us to launch a new thermal coal market outlook and cost service. And indeed, Matt Boyle has flown over from Sydney. He arrived yesterday, and he's in the main hall, if any of you are particularly interested in the outlook for thermal coal. Um, we've also opened two new offices in the last 12 months. So we've offer, opened a new office in Hong Kong, which actually opened during LME Week Asia. And we've also opened an office just last week in Tokyo. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is that it's fundamental to what we do that we bring you the very best intelligence from all of the important demand production centers of the world. So investing in these 40 people in the APAC region allows our Chinese nationals, Australians, Indians to bring that intelligence and share it with you, our customers. And the other thing we want to do and make sure we do is that your colleagues who are based in Hong Kong, Singapore, elsewhere in the world, they get the same level of service, they get the same access to analysts that you see today. And so again, by having people on the ground, we can then give those, your colleagues, the same service that we offer here. So if we move to the theme of today's presentations, commodity market uncertainty. Well, what does that mean? It could mean several things. There's certainly uncertainty of fundamentals. So this chart is Cruise base metals production value. It puts together an aggregate of the value of base metals over the last 15 years. You know, is this now a stabilization point, or are those values going to continue to fall? If they continue to fall, that clearly has an impact on margins. And there is clearly uncertainty of both price and margin in the market. Up until Friday, I was about to say that there is only one trend in LME prices, you know, but has the uptick on Friday, you know, does this now mark the bottom of LME prices? Or is it just a brief respite whilst we wait to see what happens in China? So there's that uncertainty around price, and obviously that has an impact on margin. And there's the uncertainty of investor value. So I just happen to have used the Glencore stock price here. You know, whether you look at it over one year or over about seven or eight days, you get two very different stories. And what that tells me is that investors are struggling to put a value on Glencore. They're struggling to put a value on the commodity markets at the moment. Now, some aren't. So at the same time, we've got companies like KKR, Audley Capital Management, 
We've got uh, Hydro just last week, uh, Norsk Hydro, I should say. We've got New Hope, we've got Antofagasta that have all made investments or are making investments to increase their exposure in commodities right now. Now, they're doing that despite or maybe because of the market uncertainty that we're um, experiencing today. People are desperate to get in. Um, and um, that uncertainty, so that uncertainty of fundamentals, that uncertainty of price and margin, that uncertainty of investor value, they are the topics that um, my colleagues will address today in their presentations. So, the agenda. Grant will kick off and take you through our views on the economic outlook and demand outlook. Grant will be followed by Vanessa. Um, some of you may have seen her at the LME seminar yesterday. Um, speaking, and she will ask whether we really can rely on the 90th percentile of a cost curve. And then um, our consulting guru, Colin, will round up the trio of speakers and um, really question and really maybe challenge that maybe this is a time of opportunity for some investors. We will finish with Q&A, and with that, I will hand you over to Grant, who will um, kick off proceedings. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Paul, and uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be presenting to you this morning, uh, albeit in what are uh, challenging uh, economic and market fundamentals. I'll address the question, structural downturn or cyclical recovery and its implications for metals consumption. So where are we? Uh, the best way to summarise the economic environment we currently face is the good-ish, uh, the bad, and to be frank, the downright ugly. It doesn't sound very positive because it isn't very positive, and we remain plagued by high levels of uncertainty. Broadly, the goodish parts of the global economy are the developed economies, with India being an exception uh, amongst the challenged emerging market bloc. The bad are metals end use sectors in China, particularly real estate. And the downright ugly are Brazil and Russia and a swathe of currencies. I'm going to focus on China and the developed economies from a demand point of view, as these two blocks account for around 80% of global consumption. The rest of the world's more interesting from a supply side perspective, and exchange rates will be my focus there. So starting with China, uh, China is suffering from a cyclical downturn whilst managing structural change, a difficult balancing act. Crew has been cautious on the outlook for China for some time, and we remain so, but we think that pessimism towards the Chinese economy is overdone. This chart shows year-to-date growth rates in a range of indicators in China. As you can see, the high-profile indicators are clearly weak, and these are mostly associated with metals uh, and commodities, such as real estate and auto sectors. However, the lower profile indicators, particularly consumer and service sector related ones, are performing well. Consumer and service facing parts of the economy are less uh, commodities intensive uh, than the, uh, the higher profile ones, so why should we care uh, if they're performing well? Well, firstly, we should care because it's evidence that this is rebalancing. It's not just a cycle. And China needs to rebalance in order to sustain growth rates that are relatively rapid into the future. Without rebalancing, the Chinese economy will crash, and that will be worse for all parts of the economy, but particularly for the metals-intensive ones. And secondly, we should care because these growth sectors generate jobs, they generate incomes, they provide people with spending money, which they can spend on consumer durables uh, and on housing. But economic rebalancing is messy. It's not going to proceed in straight lines. So despite the, the rebalancing background, we do see scope for a cyclical pickup in China. 
For one thing, metals end use sectors uh, are going through their own inventory correction, uh, and this will come to an end. For another, the government is actively easing policy to support the economy, including accelerating fiscal spending, funding infrastructure investment, and lowering interest rates. Most recently, the government has also targeted uh, measures at housing by further lowering mortgage down payment requirements and autos by halving sales taxes. As long as the consumer and service parts of the economy perform well, metals demand will come back. The completion of destocking will provide a further lift. So we do expect a cyclical bounce in China, but the overriding story is of slowdown and rebalancing, driven by factors including the overhang of debt, adverse demographics, and the higher priority now being given to protecting the environment. As we go forward, China will continue to become less reliant on investment and on industrial production, which are the most metals intensive parts of the economy, and increasingly reliant on consumers and service uh, sectors. So the implication is that segments of metals demand that are exposed to consumers, such as autos and appliances, should continue to perform well, but construction's contribution to demand growth will diminish. China's deceleration and its rebalancing, uh, along with its past excess investment, has resulted in increasing overcapacity particularly in aluminium and steel. Now, this excess capacity is being filled by rising exports, uh, which is worrying producers in other economies. And a range of countries are responding with protectionist measures, uh, which is an area where crew consulting is seeing an increasing volume of work. The slide here shows examples for aluminium uh, across a number of products uh, in recent years. However, we can show a similar slide for steel where in recent months, US mills have filed for protectionist measures against a host of countries on a range of products, again, including uh, cor corrosion-resistant products, cold-rolled sheet, and hot-rolled sheet. Crew expects China to be the main loser from these measures. Now, even if they were willing the developed economies are not able to consume all of China's surplus. The performance of the developed economies in recent years, you know, even seven years on from the start of the financial crisis, has been under, underwhelming, to say the least. The chart here shows a measure of uncertainty in the developed economies, which averages 100 between 1989 and the start of the financial crisis in 2008. As you can see, uncertainty has remained significantly above pre-financial crisis norms for most of the post-crisis period, and it's been a key feature in the developed economies for the three years that I've been presenting at the Crew Breakfast. Why do we care about uncertainty? Well, uncertainty is negative for economic activity uh, because it causes the postponement of spending, uh, particularly on big-ticket items such as autos, machinery, uh, and construction. Although uncertainty remains relatively high, the good news is that it has fallen significantly compared to recent years. This, along with a tailwind from lower oil prices and expected easing in the pace of fiscal consolidation and in the Eurozone and Japan further monetary easing, are providing support to the domestic demand in the developed economies. So, for example, US auto sales are currently running at their highest rate in over a decade. And in the Eurozone, mortgage lending is now growing at its fastest rate since at least 2003. Japan does face greater challenges, but positively the unemployment rate there is now at its lowest level since 1997, which bodes well for future pay rises. Nevertheless, given the scope for uncertainty to increase once more, you know, for example, due to US interest rate rises, a renewed flare-up of Greek exit concerns in Europe or spillovers from China, crew is only cautiously optimistic. So pulling this together and turning uh, to what it means for metals consumption, 
this year we can see that growth is at multi-year lows. Growth is slowing across metals, uh, as is shown in the left-hand chart, and across economies, as shown on the right. The, re the reasons for the slowdown are common, as I've previously discussed, but it's not a one-size-fits-all story. Steel is experiencing the sharpest slowdown, uh, and that's because it's particularly exposed to Chinese construction, which accounts for around 25% of global steel demand. At the same time, aluminium is benefiting from its exposure to consumer-facing sectors such as autos and packaging, uh, both in China and in the developed economies. So a cyclical recovery in consum consumption drivers and a turn in metals inventory cycles will cause a cyclical pickup in consumption growth rates. However, the structural deceleration in China means that the rate of global growth that crew expects will be reached is lower than that of the past decade. But having said that, don't write off China entirely. Its slower growth rates are on a far higher base than, say, just five years ago. And crew forecast that the country will still account for over half of the increase in global metals demand over the next five years. Now, as I flagged at the beginning, economic developments are also having a significant impact on exchange rates, and these are important to the supply side of metals markets. So the spider chart here is showing the appreciation of the US dollar uh, against a range of currencies since the April-June quarter of last year, so over the past 18 months, more or less. And what's clear is that uh, US cash is king. That's where people want to be. The dollar is the currency of choice. As economic growth prospects there are reasonable. As I said, they're not spectacular, but they're reasonable. And the next move in US interest rates will be upwards, possibly as soon as December. But as with metals demand, it's not a one-size-fits-all story. And the currencies that are most out of favour are those of commodity exporters, those with political uncertainty, and those with weak economic outlooks. So Brazil and Russia tick all three of these boxes and their currencies have collapsed over the past 18 months. The US dollar is now worth around 75% more against the Brazilian real than it was 18 months ago and it's doubled in value against the Russian ruble. But experience does vary. The dollar has gained just 10% against the Indian rupee while against the Chinese yuan it's little changed although that's in part due to heavy government support uh, from the People's Bank of China. But overall, the mixed performance of currencies is a further differentiator uh, across metals markets through their impact on costs, uh, and that's a topic that Vanessa will address shortly. So, to wrap up, the question I posed at the beginning is structural downturn or cyclical recovery? And the answer is, it's both. China is seeing a structural slowdown, and this is the key feature, I would say, of the metals demand outlook. But we expect a global pickup next year, led by the developed economies, and a cyclical recovery in China. That said, it will remain an uncertain environment, both in China and in the other economic blocks. So this is an environment in which scenario planning is needed. Now, Crew's base case is for a managed slowdown in China. But protectionism scenarios may be required for product or market-specific trade flows. And a disaster scenario uh, is one to consider, which would be one in which China crashes, driving a coach and horses through all our other assumptions. Or to put it another way, to use a rugby analogy, an Australian pack through England's World Cup hopes. But Scotland is still in. That's okay. So the depreciation, depreciation of currencies against the US dollar, especially those of major commodity exporters, will provide some cushion for suppliers until economies recover. But this cushion is not uniform. Now I'll now hand over to Vanessa, who will give you her insights on costs.
Thank you very much, Grant, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So the uh, aim of my presentation today is to examine the extent to which industry cost curves can help us determine how far prices can fall in a downturn. One of the main effects of weak demand for commodities this year, which Grant has just been discussing, has been its impact on price and producer margins. Commodity prices have continued to fall this year, and for many markets, the decline has been severe. In view of this, it's worth considering how far prices can decline from here and the extent to which the costs of production will offer price support. In order to conduct this analysis, it's customary to turn to short-run marginal costs, often defined by the 90th percentile of the cost curve. But just how helpful is the 90th percentile, or indeed the 75th or 50th percentiles, in informing us about the likely floor for prices? First, then, I'd just like to examine how far prices have fallen this year in relation to industry costs. I've cho chosen two extremes, the situation for met coal and that for copper. As illustrated, the price of met coal slumped to the 40th percentile of the cost curve in February of this year, leaving many producers struggling to remain in the market and a large proportion making financial losses. Those that, are at, those that are in operation today have lowered their costs, mainly out of sheer necessity. The situation in the copper market, however, is less critical. The average LME copper price for September indicates that the three-month quotation has only fallen as far as the 88th percentile, suggesting that it's only producers at the top of the cost curve that are really under pressure. Other markets, such as aluminium, nickel, lead and zinc, are somewhere in the middle of these two extremes. So in conclusion, all markets are currently suffering, but it's clear that some markets are in greater distress than others. Once prices fall, the initial response from producers is to protect margins by cutting costs. The extent to which this can be achieved is important, as it can prolong any potential decision to close. So how are sufficient cuts to production costs actually achieved? The answer is twofold. By reducing both controllable and non-controllable costs. In other words, it's often not just through squeezing excess fat out of the system that adequate reductions can be realised. Non-controllable cost reductions, such as falling input prices or depreciating currencies, are also critical in ensuring the survival of some mines. Taking the example of the Met coal market, shown on the left-hand side of this slide, we estimate that the depreciation of commodity currencies has led to a 10% reduction in average cost this year compared with 2014, while declining oil prices have been responsible for a further 2% fall. In addition, the closure of high-cost mines has also lowered average industry costs. On top of these reductions, Met coal miners have been aggressively lowering unit costs at the site level. Sustaining capital and maintenance expenditure is being avoided where possible. Contracts are being renegotiated. Staff cuts are being made and productivity drives implemented. We estimate that efficiency gains have lowered industry average costs by around 5%, taking the total cost reduction between 2014 and 2015 to close to 20%. On the right-hand side of this chart, at the other end of the spectrum, we show the extent to which the copper industry has experienced a reduction in costs to date. It should be noted that these costs represent actual costs as reported by a selection of the major copper producers. And so far, there's been a limited reduction in cash costs after byproduct credits, amounting to around 6% if we compare the first half of this year with the hot first half of 2014. The reduction in costs before byproduct credits has been more pronounced, but of course these reductions have been offset to some extent by falling byproduct revenues. We believe that much of the reduction in costs of producing copper to date has been the result of non-controllable factors such as depreciating currencies and lower energy costs, suggesting there is still more to do in terms of efficiency improvements and productivity gains. So in our view, costs for base metal producers still have further to fall. 
Two important uncontrollable factors driving costs lower in the current cycle have been currencies and oil prices. The key question is, will these trends be reversed in the coming years, or will they be maintained, thereby potentially leading to a sustained reduction in costs and a lower floor for metals prices? On the left-hand side of this chart, we've taken the example of copper and have produced an index of the US dollar against the major copper-producing currencies, each of which has been weighted according to its volume of copper production. Over the last 15 years, the US dollar has appreciated solidly against the major copper currencies for a number of reasons outlined in this chart. The latest period of dollar appreciation against the major copper currencies, however, has been more dramatic than previous periods and has been a key factor behind the reduction in site costs for copper miners over the last year. While we anticipate a reversal of this trend over the medium term, as you can see from the light blue line on the left-hand side of this slide, the decline will be modest in relation to the recent appreciation and will therefore have a minimal impact in lifting costs from current levels. A similar conclusion can be drawn from our forecast of oil prices, which are also unlikely to recover greatly in our outlook period. From lows of $50 to $60 per barrel in real terms, we're forecasting an increase to around $70 per barrel by the end of the decade. In conclusion, the cost reductions achieved as a result of weaker commodity currencies against the dollar and lower oil prices are unlikely to be fully reversed anytime soon. And of course, this doesn't just apply to the copper market, it's also valid for other metals to a greater or lesser extent. Having considered some of the important uncontrollable costs, I now want to move on and examine, pr examine producer decisions regarding supply cuts and closures, which can prove critical to the depth and duration of any downturn. In any recession, if prices are to stop falling, we need to see an adequate reduction in supply. To date, the supply response has varied across different markets, both in terms of its speed and the size of the production cuts that have been implemented. In copper, for example, once prices cut into the top part of the cost curve, production cuts were reasonably swift to begin. Whereas in the bulk markets, especially Metcoal, the price had to stay low for much longer before a response was forthcoming. The important point is that a miner's position on the cost curve is not the only factor driving any decision to cut output or shut down. There are many others, some of which are identified here in this chart. The strength of a company's balance sheet, for example, is obviously an important consideration. Those miners with a strong balance sheet will be able to hold out for longer as they have greater cash reserves to pull on when times get tough. Indeed, Glencore's recent cutback announcements in copper and zinc are at least partly related to the company's efforts to sustain its balance sheet. The extent to which a company has hedged its sales and the proportion that it has sold on long-term contract will also influence any closer decision, as it will afford some protection against falling prices, at least in the short term. This can often explain the lagged response of some companies to a decline in price. Government protection is often cited as a factor behind the unresponsiveness of Chinese producers to low prices, particularly the large Chinese state-owned enterprises where the existence of government subsidies and protection have long been identified. And finally, closure costs will also affect a company's decision to shut down. If these costs are prohibitively high, then it may pay to keep operating and hope for higher prices in the not-too-distant future. All of these factors will affect the speed with which an industry responds to low prices, cuts output, and returns the market to balance. Slow responding markets will ultimately see lower prices for longer periods of time than those that take action quickly. So let's take a look at the long run relationship between mine costs and prices. And for this analysis, I've used zinc as the example. So let's take a look at, so as you can see, there is a strong positive correlation between movements in costs and those for prices, implying that as prices turn down and cut into the cost curve at the 90th percentile, a supply response will take place, allowing the market to return to equilibrium and reversing the downward trend in price. 
But as we've just seen, costs are not static. They move lower depending on the extent to which input prices decline and the degree to which producers respond to the downturn in the form of efficiency improvements, production cuts and shutdowns. This highlights the need for extreme caution in interpreting cost curves. The key point is while the industry is actually in a downturn, we don't know in advance where the floor for costs is likely to settle. Any cost curve estimated before a downturn is very unlikely to look the same as one estimated afterwards, once we have full information regarding the industry's response. Crucially, once a downturn begins, it's vital to reforecast one's industry cost curves, taking into account the new environment for both cost inputs and the likely behaviour of producers. Before concluding, it's worth spending a few moments just considering the outlook for costs and the extent to which the cost reductions that have taken place will, in our view, be sustained in the coming years. To do this, I've simply compared our forecast of costs in 2020 with its most recent peak, be that in 2011 or 2012 or 2013. The larger the bar on the chart, the greater the percentage reduction in costs from the peak. For the bulks, we believe that much of the cost cutting seen to date will be sustained over the next five years, with average industry costs remaining some 30 to 40% below peak levels by 2020. To some extent, this reflects the changing structure of the industry, with the elimination of some higher cost operations and the start-up of new lower cost mines. It also reflects the fact that there continue to be abundant resources of good quality ore in these markets. But these are not the only reasons. In both iron ore and met coal, we believe that most of the controllable cost reductions will be fully sustained, and here headcount is very important. The reorganization that has taken place at many companies producing bulk commodities will not be reversed, and staff requirements are therefore unlikely to increase back to pre-2014 levels in the coming years. Another area that has been severely cut is contractor services, which again are unlikely to return to former highs. Of course, the degree to which labour costs can be cut is partly dependent on the country in question and the strength of organised labour. By contrast, the outlook for base metals is rather different. In our view, the decline in costs taking place in base metals will be less severe and will also not be as sustainable in the medium term. In the copper market, factors such as the decline in ore grades the need to develop deeper, more complex mines, the scarcity of important inputs such as water, electricity and transport in important producing regions suggests that there continues to be long-term upward pressure on costs. In the zinc market too, cost reductions are unlikely to be sustained. Insufficient exploration in recent years has meant that there is a lack of large, low-cost greenfield projects to be developed in this market implying that there continues to be a need for higher-cost mines. As a result, we're forecasting that by the end of the decade, in contrast to the bulks, base metal costs will remain just 5 to 10% uh, below recent peak levels. The key point here, as my colleague Colin will discuss shortly, is the importance of discriminating between the commodities. As we have seen, all markets are currently under pressure, some significantly more than others. But our key conclusion is that the 90th percentile, or even the 75th or the 50th of an existing cost curve constructed before a downturn, is not a good guide to the floor for prices, as it too will move lower in a recession. If anything, the 90th percentile can be seen as analogous to a rear view mirror in a car. While we all need to look back and see where the 90th percentile eventually settled, it cannot be used as a guide to what is about to take place in these markets in the future. Thank you very much for your attention, and now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Colin. Thank you, Vanessa. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As the title suggests, um, these are bleak times for commodity markets and difficult ones for mining companies. But in this short presentation, 
I want to try and lighten the gloom and consider this phase of the cycle as a time of opportunity. And I'm going to start with a question. If we don't know where we are going, do we know where we are? Now, we can all make well-informed, well-educated predictions about the future, but the fact is that nobody knows what will happen tomorrow. By the way, if anyone does know what's going to happen tomorrow, please see me afterwards, please. Um, so let's deal with the simple question, do we know where we are? To answer this question, I've compared the third quarter 2015 average prices for five metals with crew estimates of long-run marginal costs. Now, in crew, we use long-run marginal cost to drive our long-run price forecasts. Notice that the metal prices are way below their estimated long-run marginal costs by 20 to 30% in the case of aluminium, iron ore, and zinc, by just under 20% in the case of copper, by a massive 45% in the case of nickel. Does such a large gap between current prices and the long-run guidance imply that we are near the bottom of the price cycle? And how does this compare with previous price cycles? Well, history suggests we must be close to the bottom even if the timing of the turning point is, is uncertain. These charts depict historical prices since 1970 as a percentage deviation from a fitted trend line. Taking aluminium, for example, in the, in the top right, <clears throat> at the bottom of previous cycles, prices hit a low point of 20, 25% below trend. Fairly reliably so. The same is broadly true for copper and zinc, while for nickel, prices have dropped as low as 50% below trend at the trough of the price cycle. Now, if we recall the previous slide, we see that if the long-run marginal cost is the future trend around which prices will fluctuate, aluminium, nickel, and zinc are already in the region where historically they have hit the low point in the cycle. Although, as Vanessa said, copper may still have a little way to go. So in general, although we cannot predict the precise turning point and prices can bump along the bottom for several months or even quarters or even years, as some pessimists have pointed out to me, we feel that the bottom must be close. So the only way is up. I see some doubtful faces. The only way is up, or is it? Well, that depends on whether the long-run marginal cost is a good guide to the long-run price. Vanessa has amply demonstrated, I think, that the operating cost curve uh, and any percentile on the operating cost curve is a moving target, and prices often drive cost as much as vice versa. In this industry, investments have long lead times, and 30 to 40 year lives. We need something more stable to guide long-term decisions. In CREW, we use long-run marginal cost to anchor our analysis, but it is a methodology that must be used with care. The path of reversion to the long-run price will be fast or slow, steep or shallow, depending on the factors shown in the chart here. These factors are, from left to right, the initial conditions, such as the inventory, the excess capacity, the current surplus in the market, the capacity required, which is determined by demand growth, depletion rate, and the share of secondary, and the cost drivers, the input prices, productivity, and the cost of capital, because we're dealing with very capital-intensive industries. To take an extreme case, if there is a large excess of capacity very little demand growth and very little depletion, then the path to the long run marginal cost will be long and slow. So what I'm trying to say is it's when people use long run marginal costs, sometimes they're called incentive prices, they need to be used very intelligently. It isn't just a case of, oh, we have a project, here's our long run copper price, stick that in, let's see what the IRR is. 
you need, that's not the way to do it. In particular, in this cycle, recovery depends on the adequate supply response. And with China accounting for 50% of world production of some metals, that supply response needs to come from China. And that is one of the big unknowns and big worries of this cycle, and which is why one might say, well, it's always happened in the past, but this cycle is different. Personally, I think the rest of the world has reached a tipping point in terms of its willingness to accommodate China's surplus production, for example, of steel and aluminium. The influence of China is another reason why we must discriminate between commodities in terms of the path of price reversion. In terms of recovery, there's no one size fits all. Let's look at some of the initial conditions in the various markets to look at when is new capacity needed. Initial conditions can make a big difference to price reversion. The time when new capacity is needed in the market is determined by the level of inventory, the amount of existing excess capacity, and the firm and committed capacity expected to come on stream. For aluminium, we see that the market does not need new capacity for another eight years. I'm talking about smelting capacity there which compares to a lead time for building a smelter of three years. At the other extreme, a new zinc mine capacity is needed in two to three years' time, a lead time that only mine projects at a very advanced stage can meet. So the time path of price recovery for those two metals is going to look very, very different. If the long-run marginal cost, used intelligently, is going to anchor our long-term view, it should not change too frequently. Sometimes I see long-run price guidance changing with every change of direction of the wind. However, it should respond to structural change, such as a fundamental change in demand growth. If China slows down much sooner than expected, how does that impact our long-run prices? The first and obvious answer is that slower demand growth will delay the need for new capacity and it will take longer for prices to revert. The second answer is more complicated and deals with the impact on the long run marginal cost itself. If we need less capacity in the future, we might expect the long run marginal cost to fall because we don't need to develop some of the marginal assets. And that is true if we have an upward sloping supply curve, and that's more likely, as you'll see on the chart at the left, for hard rock mines. Lower demand is likely to mean a lower long run marginal cost because we need to develop less of the marginal assets. And we're dealing with industries where there is a resource scarcity. But the more downstream you go, the more powerful are the learning curve impacts associated with growth. And so lower growth might actually mean a higher long run marginal cost. In other words, if you're not building a lot of new, new capacity, you're not learning, new productivity is not getting in, embedded in, in, the, uh, in the projects. The bottom line, if we expect China to slow down sooner and faster, then it will have an impact on long run marginal cost and long run price guidance. So to recap, if we are near the bottom and prices will mean revert, albeit at different paces, what about the opportunities, the upside that I was talking about? Is this a good time to invest? If we are near the bottom of the cycle, then it clearly is a time of opportunity. With hindsight, in a few years or a few months, we may well see that for commodity prices, equity prices, asset transaction prices, we are shopping in the bargain basement. We probably only will appreciate that in retrospect. So is this a good time to invest? Well, yes and no. We don't expect companies to be making big bets on major projects. Why? Cash is short, companies and banks lack confidence, 
And building capacity adds to the problem of excess supply. Why make it worse when the recovery hasn't even started? But it's also down to the psychology associated with boom and bust conditions. Companies don't tend to make big bets in these conditions. Just as there is irrational exuberance, you see on the left-hand side there, um, so we now live in a period of irrational depression. So we don't expect people to build big projects. But it is a good time for investors and companies to be making smaller bets. For example, investors buying futures, buying shares, companies making small acquisitions, de-bottlenecking, small expansions. And none of these are billion dollar bets. And I think Paul mentioned right at the start, these bets are being made, deals are being done. And as Grant also said, cash is king. Big bets are usually made in times of irrational exuberance, often ending in tears. Is there any end to the boom and bust and its associated psychology? Can we learn any lessons? Well, I think we can fairly confidently say there will be no end to boom and bust. And if there's one statement I've made this morning that I feel utterly confident of, it's that one. But maybe there are ways to counteract the manic depressive behavior. Here are four examples of commonly identified investment biases which have become widely known in recent years. Cognitive and emotional biases. And anyone who's read that excellent book, Thinking Fast and Slow, will, will recognize some of these. The first two, myopia and herding, lead to the manic, depressive nature of the market. More than ever, we need a sense of perspective and an ability to anchor our long-run views on a detailed understanding of individual commodities. The second two, confirmation bias, seeking data support a preconceived idea, and optimism bias, overconfidence in your own ability to predict events, suggest the danger of internal groupthink and the need for an outside view, especially on major investment decisions. I certainly can recall more than a few instances of confirmation biases in my career. And the greatest value of an outside view is sometimes simply to say no. So to conclude, I have argued that these gloomy times contain opportunities. Even though the appetite for risk is low, even so, small bets can be made on an upturn. Boom and bust will not go away. Sometimes people behave as if it will, but I don't think it will. At times like this, we need to maintain a sense of perspective and a disciplined long-term thinking. Our view should not be blown around by short-term events, but we must respond if we believe there are genuine structural changes. In the next recovery, there will not be a one-size-fits-all impact on metals. Discrimination is needed based on a detailed understanding of initial conditions, committed plans, and the impact of structural changes, including China's transition to lower growth. And finally, a sizable number of economists have replaced rational economic man with a manic depressive who veers between irrational exuberance and irrational pessimism. How else to explain the febrile markets? It is easier to spot biases in others than in yourself. And this is the value of an outside view. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very for your kind attention. <laughs>